Eons ago, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge System pushed plate tectonics across the seabed, forming an underwater volcanic mountain. Ages passed, and the mantle of the Earth could no longer contain the molten lava boiling within. Liquid hot magma spewed out onto the surface, instantly cooling upon contact with the ocean. This began the formation of the Bermuda Islands. As the last ice age ebbed, sea levels rose, engulfing most of the volcano underwater. A vast coral reef system developed over time, and parrotfish began dominating the area, consuming the calcium-rich coral. Once processed through the digestive system, the coral is transformed into a fine limestone sand. Over many millennia, this sand would be pushed onto the shores of the island. Rainwater would fall down onto the sand and through a process of dissolution and cementation, limestone rock began to form. This would account for the pristine cayenne blue waters surrounding the island. But it wasn't her beauty that attracted captains and sailors alike during the age of exploration. Bermuda's always been an important navigational marker for sailors crossing the Atlantic. So ever since Europeans started traveling back and forth across the Atlantic, they've been passing Bermuda so that they can get a navigational fix. The islands are about 670 miles off the east coast of the United States. And so if you're sailing back across the Atlantic, it's a good way to get a strong idea about where you are exactly. The problem is that it's got a very treacherous outer reef system. And so what you want to do is sail close to Bermuda, but not bump into Bermuda. Many ships met their fate in these tropical waters, making this location ideal for future underwater archaeologists. In 1999, St. Mary's College of California and the University of Rhode Island collaborated together to form an underwater archaeological field school with the Bermuda Maritime Museum. There's a huge inventory of shipwrecks here that's, that makes this a wonderful teaching laboratory so we can take students and show them what these shipwrecks look like and how shipwreck technology changed over time and what it looks like underwater. Over a decade later, the field school, headed by Dr. James Allen and Dr. Rod Mather, continues to combine college-level students from all over the country to learn the logistics behind underwater archaeology. I was exploring it as a way to combine several of my passions. I've been diving for the last 10 years. It was an important part of my education at Berkeley. And I also have a love of history, and I wanted to see if there was a way I could combine them in a more of a hands-on way. From the very beginning, students are taken out onto the Bermudian coast, donned in full scuba gear, and plunged into the waters. Welcome aboard the Darlington. This 285 foot long steam driven ship crashed onto the western reef of Bermuda in 1886 on a voyage from New Orleans to Bremen, Germany. Her most distinctive features are her massive boilers that are now host to a number of marine life forms. There is not much left of the structure with this brig sailing ship known as the Caesar. She sank in 1818 on her way to Baltimore from England. Only her grindstone cargo is what's left to mark her grave. Now submerged under 30 feet of water, a 300-foot, 60-gun French frigate called the Lumière sank in 1838, attempting to seek refuge in Bermuda from turbulent weather. A 
Unfortunately, by the time Lan was spotted, the ship was too close to the reef and could not avoid her impending doom. But it's the mystery of the iron plate wreck that draws underwater archaeologists to her watery grave. Year by year, the excavation slowly reveals the origins of this unknown shipwreck. In 2010, we found some bits of pottery that are suggestive of kind of an earlier, er, early period in the 19th century, uh, maybe even the uh, 18th century, the latter part of the 18th century. But the ship construction suggests something maybe a little later than that, and uh, the cargo does as well. The way the timbers are put together, the framing pattern, and the way they're fastened suggests, in my view, something that's a little earlier than mm, the cargo suggested it should have been. So it's possible that the ship was built in the late 1700s or early 1800s and worked as a merchant vessel for many years and probably sank here sometime in the 1830s or 40s. Her cargo is where she derives her name since there were many sheets of iron plate among her wreckage. It is here where field school students learn how to uncover the ship remains. I've really enjoyed using the dredge. It's, it's pretty fun. And it's Kind of like riding a mechanical bull uh, and vacuuming at the same time. <laughs> it's great. And it's really nice to be at the front line of discovery and be the first to see things. Once objects are uncovered, students are tasked with the slow process of measuring underwater, a task not simple even on land. They use trilateration to obtain exact data points on each object. Later, they use this data to draw to scale a map of the wreck site. Due to the time constraints underwater, this process will take years to fully piece together the origins of the iron plate wreck. I feel like I'm much stronger, uh, more capable, and uh, courageous scuba diver than I ever did before. I've been really pleased to discover I feel like I'm good at these things, and that's, that's really good for someone who has uh, set their hopes and dreams on becoming an underwater archaeologist. It's really affirming to go, hey, I can do this. The goal this year was to excavate as much as we possibly could, and uh, today being the last day of the field school, I can tell you we were pretty successful. The students did a great job. They moved a lot of sand and produced excellent documentation of what they uncovered. 